Hello and good evening and welcome everyone. My name is Jonathan McRae. I'm delighted to welcome you to 60 Minute Science uh, because it's Science Week this week and this is part of the Chagas Festival of Farming and Food. I'm going to be your host for this evening and we have a fantastic event lined up for you. We'll hear from uh, lots of researchers here in Chagas who are going to be talking about food sustainability and all of the things around it. It's a free event uh, with thanks to Science Foundation Ireland and Chagask. As you can see, we're delighted to have an Irish sign, sign language interpreter with us this evening, Eva Hendrick. Eva, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Um, we're going to be here for the next hour or so, chatting with scientists from the Chagas Research Centre here in Ashtown. This centre, as I have borne witness too many times on the uh, TV programme, is a hive of activity with excellent research track record in microbial and chemical food safety, meat and meat products, cereal and bakery products, sensory science. Some of you may have had a chance to test your senses at one of the stands earlier. Um, there's also uh, uh, the field of nutraceuticals, horticulture and forestry research. Um, I hope you had a chance to explore some of the displays and ask questions of our research um, researchers here. I have to say, I thought there was a really interesting range of, of uh, things going on. It was great to, to speak to all of them. So this event is about the food that we produce and eat and how, they, uh, how that food contributes to our health. Um, these foods also have an impact on our environment, of course, and combating climate change will mean changes to food production and our diets. And so tonight, uh, the speaker is going to be addressing questions of food sustainability, safety and environmental effects. So we've got six speakers this evening and after each talk of just five minutes, you're going to get an opportunity to ask speakers questions. So we have Carol there with a the microphone and just raise your hand and we'll get to you as quickly as we possibly can. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker. He is Owen Corbett. His uh, talk is called Can Horticulture Be Any Greener? Um, Dr. Owen Corbett is a horticulture researcher at Chagas Research Food Centre Food Research Center, and he's also going to be—he's going to be discussing alternatives to peat for growing fruit and vegetables. Don't know why I struggle through all that, but anyway, Owen, over to you. Owen, thanks very much, Jonathan. Thanks, Jonathan, for that intro, uh, and hi, everybody. It may look like I've set out the breakfast stall here at the Premier Inn. Um, <laughs> there we go. This sounds better. But. Uh, I'm actually, and I know some of you are probably feeling a bit peckish, I'm not here to feed you. I'm going to run you through a fairly protracted metaphor, uh, and I hope for your sake, as well as mine, that you know the story of Goldilocks and the three bears. So, I don't have Goldilocks here in studio, but we do have Butterhead. So Butterhead, like Goldilocks, is fairly fussy when it comes to um, how she is raised. So she's lived a fairly sheltered existence under glass, where she's never got too hungry or too thirsty, never been too hot or too cold. And that's down to the grower. So conditions of predictability are crucial for a grower when it comes to planning their crop cycles or their harvests, as well as managing inputs such as fertilizer, irrigation and energy. And so uh, like all of, other, all of her other compatriots here, from Tommy the tomato to Mushing the mushroom, they're all quite familiar with peat. Now, don't worry, peat's not another character in the story. I'm talking about moss peat. So peat is a bit like porridge, so at last we get to the breakfast table. Peat is like porridge because it's highly consistent as a material. So when you go down for your porridge in the morning, you open the bag of oats, you expect to see the same product taste, feel and smell is the same as the previous bag that you open. So consistency is key. And when you add your dollop of honey into the porridge, you don't expect any adverse chemical reactions. And the same can be said for peat when you're adding in your fertilizer. As well as that, both peat and porridge are highly adaptable, flexible materials. So what I mean by that is Daisy here likes her jumbo oats with a bit more texture, okay, a bit more air in the root space allows for freer drainage, whereas someone like Butterhead prefers ready brec, a bit more of a finer mix. Um, and so peat is, as I'm sure I've highlighted now, is an incredibly good growth media, but it's not all that great for the planet. Peat, when it's harvested, uh, has, you have to drain the bogs and peatlands to get the peat out. And as soon as you do that, it starts to release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. About 3% of the globe is covered in bogs and peatlands. 
and they account for more carbon stored than all of the world's forests combined. On top of that, they're incredibly important ecosystems, so they support a wide biodiversity, as well as playing host to some of our threatened bird species that overwinter and breed on peatlands. As well as that, if you hadn't been to the Midlands in recent years, I suggest you go and have a look at Clara or Lullymore, or one of the preserved and conserved bogs out there, and just see how beautiful they are for yourselves. So not only do they serve the flora and the fauna, but ourselves as humans as amenity spaces. So with all that being said, uh, the Beyond Peat project which I work on is helping to support a transition away from the predominant use of peat in the professional horticultural sectors towards alternative, more sustainable materials. And the likelihood is we're not going to find one silver bullet to cure it. Uh, and so we'll look to something that resembles a bit more of a muesli type situation, where you have various materials or ingredients blended at different proportions to service all of the various horticultural crops. And so these ingredients we hope to source on the island of Ireland from the biocircular economy. And that means either as renewable resources like wood or plant fibres, which are renewed year on year, or as derivatives or byproducts of our industries and the way we manage our green spaces and landscapes. And if we can do that and find the right proportions and inventory of raw materials, we're then going to work on the processes to transform these into usable growth media for all of these model crops. And so we'll look to tweak processes such as composting or pyrolysis to generate optimal growth media for all of these crops. On top of that, we're also going to grow commercial-like trials where we take model crops such as these and uh, see how they perform when they're grown in various growth media. So whatever the muesli looks like, it's going to have to be safe for you, the consumer. It's going to have to perform well. It's going to have to be more sustainable than peat and available at a scale to service the demand, as well as that it has to come at an acceptable cost to growers. So with that being said, hopefully we can find a mix of ingredients that's just right hey. for horticulture to be even greener into the future. Thanks, Emilian. Great. So uh, if you have any questions for Owen, please uh, raise your hand and uh, we'll get Carol to get to you. So um, why don't we just grow crops in the soil? So soil. Uh, so I mentioned the growers are all about predictability yeah. and being able to predict when their crops are going to come on. Soil is just a little bit too unpredictable. There's a whole microbiome in soil that might affect the performance of plants. Right. We also don't know what the nutrient content of a lot of soils is beforehand. Okay. So, um, what are you looking at? Because you said you want to move away from peat because sure. you want something more sustainable. Like, are you trying anything? Or have you got a vague idea of what you're looking for? So the first part of the project, we're going to look at what's near to market or nearly there in terms of research and development. So we do have growth media producers in Ireland. And so we're going to look to what they have as alternative first. Right. And then we'll look to some more novel materials. So I mentioned industry. One of the things, we have a big industry here of brewers and distillers. So we can look at spent brewery grain perhaps as a substitute or a component of growth media. We're also looking at very technical processes, the likes of uh, biochar production through pyrolysis. And uh, some of those technologies have actually the benefit of locking away some carbon in the process as well. So we're going to try and refine some of those processes to uh, service all of the various horticultural subsectors as well. But I, I would have thought that the very fact that the peat is very, it's a very specific thing and it's very good for growth, like surely you're not going to get that same result from waste from brewers. I mean, it, it's a very different thing. How are you yes. going to get the same result? Yeah, well, so the brewer's grain will be the raw material and it'll be just a component part of a blend of materials. Right. So we're going to have to mix blends to service the needs of all of these crops. So the uh, grain might be something like the scaffold that you then infuse with some sort yeah. of nutrients or some and, sort of and growth And some factors. of these have different qualities as well. So some might be very nutrient rich. So we need to pair that with something that maybe locks away some of the nutrients. So we have to, that's part of the challenge is f figuring out how materials interact when they're, when they're mixed as well and at what proportions they have to be mixed. Are any of these very, very picky? I mean, are there some fruits and crops that are that you could probably not have to fuss too much and they'll grow anyway? 
or or and are there others that are very very difficult and need need very specific conditions to grow? So there are some difficult uh, scenarios. So uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, but a lot of your field vegetables start out their life as little plug plants, and they've been grown in peat uh, typically, and that's because you can pull them out and it's quite robust. So when the roots have grown out down through the peat, you can just stick that in the ground, no problem at all. Right. Whereas with some of the other materials, uh, they have a tendency to break apart. So that's going to be a particularly challenging area is to, um, and we're looking at maybe manufacturing some scaffold out of um, biodegradable plastics that might hold the structure while they're put into the ground. So that's a particularly challenging area. Okay. But there's other breakthroughs. Uh, so it might perhaps be a little bit more easy for some of the more robust plants, like your hardy perennials, uh, to use peat alternatives. And some nurseries are actually starting that transition. We have a question here? Yep. Are there any commercial Sorry. products yes, available? Sorry. Sorry. So the question was, is there any commercial products <laughs> available at the moment? Yeah. Uh, so there, there are, um, and there are peat alternatives on the market. Um, and so what we're really looking to do is independently assess how these perform as well. So we get sometimes you get guarantees from the manufacturers, but then you have to go and test them independently too. This is going to sound like a really stupid question, but I do that all the time in the radio program. If you know anything about it, what like do other countries also use peat? I mean, it, peat seems like a very Irish thing, or mm. is that just my my hibernocentrism? Uh, it's a big word. <laughs> no, you're right. So other countries do, in fact, use peat, and they have used Irish peat uh, for a, a long time as well. What? Irish, Irish peat is considered the Rolls Royce of peat. Uh, I see. Um, and so they have used Irish peat, and we've been exporting peat for that purpose as well. Uh, I have to preface that by saying the horticultural sector uses a very small amount of peat relative to other uh, energy production, for instance. But yes, we have actually used, they have used Irish peat in the, in the past. And they all have various timelines for phasing out peat use as well. Right. So, um, there, are, there are kind of timelines in place there, and they differ throughout the EU. Very good. Any other questions? Oh, we've one over here. Yes, Seamus. Um, hi. Um, what does peat actually do? You know, you've, you've, you see hydroponics and you see um, these type of plants growing with their roots down in water and they're pumping water with all the nutrients through. Is it a cation exchange or is it, is it what does it actually improve in the soil and what's it, what, yeah, what, what's it required for? I know it's hummus, but uh, yeah. what does that do in the soil? That? So for, depending on the crop, uh, some actually require a support of the root system through a structure. Um, so even though a lot of plants are actually grown hydroponically, they're hydroponically grown, but they're actually set into growth media as well. So you're pumping the water through uh, a growth media. Uh, so only very few crops can actually be grown purely in, in water and nutrients like that. So it provides a bit of a structure there. Uh, and a lot of the materials, is, for instance, mushrooms require a very specific moisture retention uh, properties which peat can serve us. Super. Yeah. Super. Well, Owen Corbett, everyone. Thanks very much, Owen. Thank you. So our next speaker is uh, Diane Purcell Merink. She is uh, a Marie Curie Fellow based at Chagas Research, uh, Food Research Centre in Ashdown here uh, in the bio food si Biosciences Department. Uh, Diane completed the first part of her project in Australia and New Zealand with the Coth Cothran uh, Institute. Diane will outline her seaweed protein research work and why seaweeds are so important to our lives. Diane, you'll hope you do a better job than I have. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, so yes, I'll uh, I'll give you a little bit of a story on on seaweed. I'll, I don't think it's going to be as exciting as Goldilocks, but I'll do my best. <laughs> um, so this is a a bag of seaweed, and it thankfully looks uh, loves to live in an environment like this behind me. Um, this is a an Irish species, a native Irish species, and it's called corlock in Irish or orweed. And so I'll just tell you a little bit of a story of how it gets from there into my bag and then onto. Uh, the, the actual work that I've been doing here. Um, what's nice about this kind of an image is that it oozes that ocean environment, it oozes the sea, if you're, it reminds you of your holidays, especially this time of year, and it gives you the impression of an environment that's just fresh, healthy, full of nutrients, and basically it, it uh, 
it allows you to understand why a seaweed, I suppose, would like to live in this environment. We're very, very lucky uh, with our seaweeds. We have a, a wide variety of them. I was lucky to be in uh, Donegal last week or two weeks ago now. And uh, this is Mulroy Bay. And this environment here is also a mussel farm, organic mussel farm. And so the lines are seeded um, with the seaweed. And this was the team um, or part of the team that I was working with up there. So you can see the weather, it does change. And uh, unfortunately, it's not always perfect. And in Ireland, interestingly enough, I'm not sure if you're aware, but we've actually been working with seaweed for, for quite a long time. This is uh, some images from the west coast of Ireland that have gone back to the 1830s. And um, they actually have been running a, a, a thriving industry there for about 75 years. And so uh, this middle image here, they're actually burning kelp and the reason it's called kelp is basically because it was burnt and um, the word came from the burning of it and then it's turned into a block and those blocks were then shipped to Scotland and there it was turned into iodine and if anybody's ever had a had a cut on their hand and the brown stuff your mother puts on the betadine that's iodine so it comes from brown seaweeds and so if you've ever if everybody's young enough to remember the field hmm. the very beginning <laughs> this, that's it, the bull. So um, this is uh, this is Tyg and, and and the bull, um, the lovely Richard Harris, and they're doing a little bit of uh, seaweed. So they're actually taking this, they're putting it on their beautiful f field uh, down in in what was it, Kerry officially, but it actually it was filmed in Mayo. And uh, basically, they ended up um, showing you the the function of of seaweeds. So Ireland has a huge history. This species here is called the giant kelp. So if uh, as its name. Uh, could could imagine it. Uh, this is a school ruler. Everybody who's from, come from school today, thanks for coming. So twice the length of this, or a third of my height, because I'm so tall, um, is how fast this grows in a day. Sixty centimeters. So it's a. Uh, this species um, runs off the. It's quite ubiquitous in its range. So it grows around the world. But um, this is off Tasmania, where I was lucky to be working. And <laughs> this is one of the last bits um, that's still there because of climate change and, and nutrient changes and the East Australian current. Um, this is one of these species that's under super um, heavy threat of climate change. So um, very lucky to be able to work on this one. And uh, this is an image of, um, so if you're talking about um, species of, of seaweed, they are, you are really what you eat. So um, if you live, live in a beautiful environment like Ireland and if, you've, um, and if you're a seaweed like this and it's got this awesome water, the water that you're living in and the absorbance of the nutrients basically it turns you into what you look like today. So a bit like the Goldilocks story, if, you're, if you've got the right peat, you're going to be the right mushroom. If you get the right environment here, you'll end up as, as the right type of seaweed. And then I can potentially, you know, torture you in my lab and turn you into something else. <laughs> um, this image is actually a, a colleague of mine from my lab in, um, in Australia. And if you don't think you've had any touch of seaweed today, well, I'll, I'll try and change your mind. So from the bubbles in your shampoo to the moisturizer on your skin, to basically the um, gut biota, your tummy that you've talked about, I, um, IBD outside, some of the people have been telling you. So if you're trying to fix some of the irritable bowel syndromes and things like that, a lot of the components that you'll find now, even in dietary supplements, comes from seaweed. Um, these violins are actually made of seaweed and she did play them. She's quite a good fiddle player um, in her lab last year. So you can free seaweed and um, buy some stuff off um, the web and you can actually make a, a seaweed violin. Um, if you're living in Australia about 30,000 years ago and you're lucky enough to get your hands on some seaweed, this is actually the equivalent to your camelback if you're a hiker. And if you're somebody who likes marathon running, um, this is actually an edible seaweed pod. So it's made of seaweed and it's full of uh, Luke State Sport 2019 in the marathon in London. They were given about 200,000 of these. So they went from 900,000 bottles, about 25% drop that year in the number of bottles because they ate these. And uh, it's... It, Ua is actually the company, so that's why that's written there. And so you can see here, the waste was huge, so they decided to try and, and switch that up. It was a fantastically um, positive and successful campaign, even though she does look like she's kind of, I don't know what she's doing there, but it went over really well. So we're, ba we're back on to my species, uh, Corlock or Orweed. And for my work here in Ashtown, we were looking at, looking at bioproducts. So what products can we get out? So I didn't make any pots of um, bubbles, but this is a... a image of my lab and we used a scalable system. So if you're our rich wheat and you're trying to get products out of seaweeds, you need a scalable system, which means that you can scale it up. You need to use as little nutrients as possible if you can. And this is just a basic filtration system at the end of the product of the project. And then you have to try and test it and see if it's got anything exciting in it. In my case, I was quite lucky. So I was able to find um, a species, I'll come back to that one in a second. I was able to find a species that went from my little bag of, of, of greeny stuff 
I was able to do some extraction on it with some enzymes, like you would do if you even think about the enzymes that are in anything from your tummy to your, your clothes getting uh, washed, the enzymes are used. And then what I actually was able to produce was a, as a powder, which I now use um, on a few trials in my lab, and I found that it could potentially be useful for blood pressure. So it's a very, very exciting story. It's an Irish sustainable seaweed species, and, and it grows about all along the Irish Atlantic Way. So it's basically from pretty much Donegal all the way down to Kerry, about 56% of our coastline. And it has been there for about 16,000 years. So it's a fascinating species, and we're lucky that it still likes to live in this environment, even with our temperature increasing. So it's, a, it's one of those resources that we're really, really lucky that we have and that it, it's sustainable. Um, brown seaweeds love the water around our coastline, so we're very, very fortunate. And so just to wrap up, if you are what you eat, and obviously now you know seaweed is fascinating and really, really, really important to your life, you need to look after your oceans because it looks after us. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Diane. Um, okay, so first question, uh, are there any problems with farming seaweeds? Um, well, I suppose the big one you probably have heard of, heavy metals. So people will turn around and say the first thing about iodine um, and thyroid and all those issues because um, you end up having everything that, as you say, you are what you eat, everything that you absorb from the environment. And these are fantastic scrubbers. Um, so any environment that you're in, so whether you're off a, a you know, a sewage um, outlet or whatever, which they do love living in, some of these guys love to live in that, those environments, you're picking up every everything that's in that water mm. and heavy metals do naturally accumulate. So that's one of the big, um, not necessarily a bottleneck, but it's definitely a concern. So I've done a lot of this testing in my lab where I can control the water supply and I can control the, the nutrients and the metals in the water. And so that's crucial. It, it presumably it would be d impossible to commercially farm seaweed outside of the natural environment of the sea. It, yeah, and so the whole reason, I suppose, if we're looking at switching to natural, to an aquaculture environment, and, you know, obviously Asia does 90, pretty much 99% of, of aquaculture in the world is done there, and Europe is getting in, in on that game, about 1%. I looked at some stats, the board BIA has said we do 40,000 tonnes, and there's about 9 million tonnes per year in the seaweed industry. So you, you love the environment from the fact that it's free, it's cheap, um, it's present and it's not on land. So there's there's so many pluses, but you do need to make sure that the water quality is what you need. So the metals is definitely the thing probably most people will, will think about. Questions uh, from the floor? Moira? I, I was just wondering, um, are there a lot of seaweed farms at the moment in Ireland? <laughs> it's, it's, it's exactly what I Googled this afternoon, Moira, actually. Um, <laughs> funny, so, <enough. laughs> funny you should ask. Um, but uh, to be honest, it's, it's, it's still very much a cottage industry. These guys up in Mulroy Bay and those along the west coast of Ireland, I mean, I was struggling to find, you know, specific numbers. As I say, with the 40,000 tonnes of wet weight uh, seaweed per year, which is what we're, we're producing, isn't a huge amount. Um, the lads up in, in Mulroy Bay, as I say, they run mussels, so they do what we call mixed aquaculture. So they tend to have mussels and then they'll have salmon and then they'll have seaweed. So, so I couldn't get an exact stat. I'm not sure anybody else here might have that information. No, no, <laughs> some of you might. Um, but it was, yeah, it's not a huge number. And I did ask exactly that. These guys have been up in Muller Bay for 30 years. And I said, you know, is there, is there an industry behind an industry? Is there more? You know, I said, but um, they, couldn't, they couldn't fill in the gap for me. So, yeah, I'm still trying to figure out an exact number. It seems like every, I'm hearing about seaweed all the time at the moment. And, you know, if we look at how we have used our natural resources, I, this is a small kind of red flag in my head going, surely the seaweeds are important for biodiversity. And uh, I'm just wondering, should we be harvesting them in on mass? Is there a danger to doing that? Well, this is it. Uh, the and then then all of us who know more about seaweeds will say it. Um, the legislation around EU, but also in Ireland, is is colossal um, and and a major bottleneck. So I hate to use that word bottleneck, but it is a problem. So that is so there's. 20, 20 or five or so companies who are allowed to naturally wild harvest. This species that I talked about, the giant kelp with my ruler, um, that has been wild harvested off, um, off Chile. And really what we want to try and do worldwide, the wild harvesting has dropped to less than 7% of the whole lot. So you really don't try and avoid it. Yeah. This one can obviously probably take quite a good bit of wild harvesting yeah. at this point, but it would be much better like any crop to, you know, do as little of that um, invasiveness to an extent and take what you can from an environment Probably, probably put it in the same area for sure, but uh, take something that can be harvested and then um, then put seed, in, seed it again the following year. Question here from the floor. Diane, um, 
There's a lot of talk about using seaweeds to reduce methane emissions and the red seaweed from Australia, which you said is a brown seaweed. Has it any potential in this one? Um, it doesn't. It doesn't. I've worked on that one too and it doesn't have the same kick. Um, interestingly, New Zealand and Australia are putting huge amounts of money into that space. Um, the sea, uh, Chagas has worked on that in the past, but there are some side effects to the impact of the of that seaweed within the diet of the of the unglets for, so your, for your cows. The biggest issue is the amount at the moment the guys in New Zealand and Australia are trying to cut that number but for us we don't have enough of as, uh, Asparagopsis which is the red species uh, Taxiformis or, or the other species to to play that game right. um, and based on my colleagues here in Chagas who've done this work uh, they said that's a it's a it's a dead rubber last question from the back um how do you farm seaweed? How do you farm it? Well, it's, yeah, well, um, I could probably show you lots of images, but basically you cut it. So um, so what we were doing up there in, in uh, up in Donegal is you're putting a big long line and interestingly enough, they use the gooey stuff from the seaweed itself to stick little, little baby seaweeds onto the lines, which is super cool because I saw them doing it. And then we put the lines out into the water and then they basically just hang in that environment in about three or four months, depending on the species. They float down and you end up with this big, long hair like, you know, brown stuff that hangs. And then you come along with basically uh, if you're if you've got a normal um, fishing vessel, you've got a normally a crane. So you pull it up and then you have a chopping little blade and you just chop it into a, into basically a big bin. So you hmm. pull it up and chop, chop, chop. It's quite heavy as well. I think I'd like so, to see that. Yeah, it's super cool. So there's if you if you YouTube this stuff, there's guys in the Faroe Islands that do some, they've got some really old school stuff, which is kind of crazy to look at. And then there's other guys called Arctic Seaweeds that have like really, or, you know, automated, very Norwegian, very nice. But the guys in Faroe Island are... Arctic it's Seaweed. All. Arctic Seaweed, yeah. I think I and saw then them the play Faroe, electric pit. Uh, uh, <laughs> Forest, uh, what's it called? For, forest, ooh, what's it called? Yeah, forest something is the guys up in the Fair Islands. So the students would love that one. Right. Uh, ladies oh. and gentlemen, thank oh. you very oh. much to Diane. Diane, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Uh, our third speaker is Eduarda Neves. Uh, she's a researcher uh, in the Food Quality and Sensory uh, Science Department. Uh, she's going to tell us about the use of insects as an alternative protein source. Eduarda, everyone. So, hi, everyone. As John said, I'll, uh, I'll give you a tour through the insects tonight. As you can see here, I brought some of the little friends for you to see. They are all edible, we are safe. <laughs> so, um, like starting uh, with the intro, uh, we all know at the moment that um, by 2050, uh, we will be around 10 billion people in our planet, which means that our population is increasing so rapidly. So, which means, and uh, we will take us um, to a food shortage and to a protein supply shortage. So, for that, um, we will need to consider um, another alternative protein sources or, let's say, more sustainable sources of protein. So, with that, we bring the, our insects um, to this game. And our insects... Uh, edible insects are very well known and widespread that they are uh, a huge source of uh, high valuable protein as well as they have a very nice content of vitamins that we all know minerals and the good fatty acids like in the let's say the omega-3 and omega-6 that we all know about it and on top of that the insects um, for the production of insects, uh, let's say they are environmentally friendly when compared to, let's say, farming cows or farming for beef or farming for pigs or something like that, because the amount of, let's say, the, the amount of land or the amount of energy or the amount of water that we need to produce insects, it's far, far less than we need for the other type of activities. So let's say, for example, <coughs> To produce 10 kg of beef, we will need an Aviva stadium. But to produce the same amount of insects, we need a tiny bedroom. So this big, this, this, all these factors are turning the insects um, 
like the future, one of our future proteins, and uh, making them very sustainable. So here in Chagask, what are we doing? <coughs> Sorry. So we are doing, we are trying to understand how we can modify the, um, the, the nutritional value of our mealworms and our uh, crickets because we are feeding them with, let's say, non-used food, food products. We are uh, feeding them, for example, with uh, wheat bran or oats or, let's say, chicken feather meal. We, we are also using, for example, let's say, red blood cells from porks and uh, in the powder form to understand how they can accumulate and, for example, to be in the future a uh, superfood full of iron for all of us. But are they safe for consumption? This is something that we are uh, learning and studying at the moment. So what I'm doing with my colleagues here in Chagask is we are screening the bugs that are present on them. But we have... Uh, so far, we are just learning because the insects are not uh, yet legal for consumption in Ireland. But what we are finding so far is that the, they are within the frame guidelines for minced beef, the minced beef that we found on, in our supermarket shelves. So, so far, they are very, very promising. But we have one question. What about to eat them? We all know that the Europeans look for the insect as like yuck, like a, a yuck factor. Like, I will ask, will you eat this for tonight? Well, what we are trying to do here with uh, our research community, what we are trying to do is just trying to find a way to produce and process a, uh, an insects as ingredients to incorporate them further in this delicious type of foods. Let's say, for example, if you didn't knew it, you will eat it, right? They look delicious, but they, they are all insect powders we have here. For example, this granola is with cricket powder. This uh, carrot spread is with mealworm powder. And these are mealworm pa pasta and so on. For example, we have that cricket powder that we can use for, to go to the gym. Uh, and make our protein shakes and so on. So uh, with that, and to wrap up, I think, in my opinion, that insects are, are very sustainable and I think they are one of our future proteins. Thank you. Your questions for Eduardo, please. You can uh, raise your hands. Um, so Eduardo, <laughs> how many edible insect species are known so far? As far as I know, we have around 2,000 ed edible uh, species. Is it, I mean, obviously the, um, the biological makeup of a, an insect is very different to a human being. So presumably they don't carry the same sort of diseases that uh, we might get from eating mammals, for example. Uh, like what you, uh, no, we will have some uh, pathogen, not by we will have some food born um, bugs, let's say, but uh, there's no more information about it at the moment. Right. That's okay. why this is under legislation to become a novel food in the, in the future. Right. So at the moment, we don't know if we eat a certain type of insect, whether or not it might give us a, a, a certain type of disease. Exactly. And that's why you're screening these different types of, uh, of insects. That's okay. It. Yeah. Uh, any questions from the floor? Um, Yes. Definitely there are companies that are already selling this. Yes. Have you tried yourself? And no. Uh, do you want me to go to jail? No. <laughs> so no, we cannot eat them in Ireland. We, uh, all the, these products that uh, I'm screening here in Chagas, they are all uh, bought from another European countries like Netherlands or Germany. In Ireland, it's not legal. But you must have yet. tried them on your no, travels. No, I actually saw you yesterday yes. trying the lollipop on the screens. Was it nice? No, it's disgusting. Okay. <laughs> well... All of these things are disgusting. Okay. <laughs> I want you to know we're not quite there yet. I, I have tried through, I, I, I used to do a TV show, a, a stage show, and we did, we did a lot of stuff on insects. All of it's gross. It sticks in your teeth. It's not, it's, it's not particularly pleasant. We're not quite there. The packaging looks great, but we're not quite there yet. <laughs> yes, question up here. Can we get the microphone up there? Um, maybe I'll cover. 
Can I just ask a question while I'm going up? Eduardo, why are some of the countries in Europe allowed to sell and uh, the insects, but we're not? Are we not under we're the same legislation? EU, yeah. Yes, like at, by 2018, um, when when the, the new legislation was uh, about to be screened again, uh, some countries were already farming them and producing them. But since Ireland were not having nothing uh, in these regards, we were not uh, yet allowed to continue doing it, to do it, actually. Um, Justin, here. Uh, Eduardo, what's the percentage of protein in this versus meat? What's the comparison? It can be in between 40 to up to 70% of protein in the insects. Okay, so so just because we're at the moment, the seaweed guy is trying to get 40% seaweed protein into seaweed <laughs> burgers. Could we could we kind of hide some of them in burgers? Would that be a better... Can we all, what? Say, like, hide put the, some of the insects put them in, in the, you know, We can, yeah, yeah, we can do that, yeah. So that would be... We can make a deal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's good. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, you talked about feeding some of these insects blood. Yes. It's a blood. Uh, the bio, it's, a, it's part of the production process. Blood is made. Is made. Is that right? Yes. And you can put it in a powdered form and get these insects to eat it. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So this this is <laughs> this is what we call red blood cells, uh, powder red blood cells from the pork industry. So this is a cut product from the from the production stream, and instead of going to the waste. We just uh, dry them and feed the insects so as, the, a, as a biocircularity. And so the hope is that they'll eat the, the, the blood, get the iron from the blood. Then when we eat them, we'll get the iron. Exactly. How about we just bypass the insect part, though? No, we cannot. <laughs> Why not? No. <laughs> because we need the iron, though. Well, okay. All okay. right. Okay. <laughs> uh, any other questions? for? Oh, we've one more. Yes. How could you farm insects? Insects are very interesting. Uh, are, are very, it's a very clean and... Um, let's say a very clean and sustainable uh, way of farming. Like usually what they do is they have like trays where they stalk them in v vertically. So you put them in a tray with the substrate and the feet and then another tray full of them and so on. So you will find like a tower of Legos, but instead of Legos, you have the insects inside. And then do you have like a mummy insect and a daddy insect? Yes. And they, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and the babies. Eduardo, thanks very much. You're welcome. Uh, I don't know why I keep going over there. <laughs> I'm not quite with it today. I keep going over there for no reason at all. Uh, okay, our next speaker is Carlos Alvarez. Uh, his uh, uh, research uh, is from the Food Quality and Sensory Science Department here at the Chagas Food Research Centre in Ashtown. Uh, he's going to be explaining how he and his colleagues have found a solution that addresses two important envir environmental issues at once. Really cool stuff from Carlos. Thank you so much. So, yeah. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, this talk is about dos pájaros de un tiro, or what you say in English is two birds in one stone. So what I'm trying to explain in this talk is how we have facing a big environmental challenge with the meat production industry, and how we can use this environmental challenge to resolve another issue that we're facing. So I'll try to explain the both of them but it is very briefly. But first of all, oh, sorry, uh, why is a problem with the meat industry? We're killing and slaughtering many, many animals every year. And uh, not everything is used as meat. So as you can see here, if you are lucky, maybe the 40, 50% of the animal weight of the animal is a red meat, while the other is considered the offal, the fifth quarter, and it's composed by the skin, the bones, and which is more interesting for me, from blood. Um, why I'm very interested about blood, because I was watching a lot of vampire movies when I was a kid, <laughs> but also because for the last 15 years, I have been researching on how to make a good use for the blood, how to make new ways of processing the blood, and how to apply in different ways. So let's put some numbers on that. In Ireland last year, we killed two millions of pork, Sorry, two millions of beef and four million of pork. If you consider from each single pork, you can get 3.5 liters of blood, and from each cow, 18 liters. If you put all together, it will be sufficient to fill 18 Olympic pools. If you put it at the European level, it will be sufficient to fill 900 Olympic pools, which is a lot of blood. And also, please remind that according to European legislation, the blood needs to be collected and used and utilized for something else. 
So we have to face that as well. At the moment, um, as you can see, the blood is used for very little things, so it can be go, go into the, blood po uh, the black pudding and things like that. But the vast majority of the blood is collected, and as you can see, it can be separated into different fractions. One is the plasma, which is the liquid fraction of the blood, and the other fraction is the solid fraction of the red cells that Eduardo spoke before. Okay? We can use plasma very well. It can be used in pharma, it can be used in research, it can be used for ingredients in food products. But we don't use red cells, you understand, in food products because it's very colorant. It changes the color of everything. The taste is very bitter and metallic. If you apply this to many products, it spoils the product faster. So we have to look for alternative uses of the blood. Okay. Nice. Uh, so... Another alternative use for the red cells is that can be used for aquaculture or for feeding animals, but this doesn't take the whole volume of the blood that we are generating. So here in Chagas, we thought about things that we could do with the blood, and we were looking for alternative ways of, of using that. And we thought that we can use the proteins, and proteins is the first key word I would like to, you to remember, proteins. It's something we would like to use uh, for another alternative uses. Okay. I mentioned before that we are facing another environmental challenge, and this is the plastic based on petrol. These are biopolymer, these are polymeric plastics, and that's the second key word I would like to remember, polymers. Okay? And we produce huge amounts of plastic every year. It will be sufficient to fill two million Olympic pools just in one year. In the best of the cases, it can be recycled, can be reused, but the 50% of the plastic we generate every year is just used once, and it ends the most of the time in the environment. So this plastic degrades very, very, very slowly. It can take several years, up to 20, 30, 40 years, or even more, and it accumulates in the environment. So nowadays, in the oceans, you can find around 50 trillions of particles of plastic that goes to your water, that goes to your fish, so it's coming to, into our diets. Uh, this amount is sufficient to fill around, yeah, 200 Olympic, sorry, 1,300 pools, which is the equivalent of 1,000 of blue whales, which you can imagine how, how much plastic are in the environment. Uh, so we thought that, we, what, what can we do with these two things? And if you remember, I mentioned that proteins and polymers are the main two words to remind. And the good news is that proteins are a type of polymers. So we thought, okay, we can use polymers or the proteins to make a polymer to make a new bioplastic or new a new material. And we did it. It was not like that. It took several years, yes, for trying and research, but we find the ways to make a plastic out, out of the blood, which is that one, okay? That's the, the plastic we did. We were looking for applications. Um, the main application we found is uh, for food packaging. We can use this for food packaging, but we found another applications as well. Um, and this is one of the main ones. So, as I said, we are reducing the, the amount of red cells that are wasted or not used. We are reducing our dependence on petrol-based plastics. So that's a win-win situation, which means like dos pájaros de un tiro. Thanks, Carlos. Very fascinating Very welcome. and, quite frankly, disgusting talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any questions from... Uh, yes, a uh, lady straight away there. Thank you, Carla. So my big question is, at present, what's happening to all the blood? Where is it all going? So nowadays, the, um, all the blood generated in Ireland is collected by a single company. It goes in the swimming pools. Yeah. <laughs> if you go to the National Aquatic Centre, you might find <laughs> everything there. But it's collected by that company. And they do the processing that they explained before. They separate it to the plasma and the red cells. The plasma is a street used for animal feed, the most of it. If you collect the blood hygienically, it can be used for food applications as well. The red cells, the other fraction, the most of it is used for fertilizer, composting, or landfilling. Small bits are used for pet food. Small bits are used for aquaculture. But uh, if you think about the protein quality that we have in there, the red cells, they have like a 60% of essential amino acids. That's what's, what we like to see in our proteins. Uh, and it's wasted. So it's a very good source of uh, protein. So bioplastic is just one of the things we're looking at, how to, how to use that. But it would be much happier if we could use this 
into the food chain supply, you know? So one of the options we look at, as Eduardo said, is that we incorporate these proteins into the food chain in another shape that is not that bad taste or not that bad appearance. Over here. Two questions, if I may. Uh, first is, uh, can I eat this particular plastic? Second is, would this be very expensive? Would be not practical to manufacture yeah. it? You can eat them. It's fully edible. All the chemicals or reagents we're using are all food grade. So it's, it's not toxic. The taste will be horrible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I wouldn't eat that. But it's, it's safe to be in contact with the food. That's not a problem. And then if you consider that some of the companies are paying a fee just to get the blood disposed, if they, and so how they manage to get the production on their own site and they manage to sell this or to produce the plastics they need, might be cheaper. But at the moment we are, no. Petrol-based plastic is much cheaper to produce. They have like 200 more experience than us making plastics out of petrol. We started like 10 days, 10 years ago. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Oh. Sorry, may I? Thank you, Carlos, for the talk. Uh, the fractionation that you're talking about, uh, the question that was asked first, that what happens to the blood, and you mm. said we can fractionate it, yeah. and there are many applications. For the fractionation to take place, isn't it supposed to be processed in a window of time because otherwise it coagulates? So is it being done at... No, the, when you, the blood is collected from the animals mm -hmm. and you add an anticoagulant to that. At that scale? Uh, yeah. For every place that you collect it? So that? when you collect the blood from the pork, you, you use like a hollow knife, it's called. It goes straight into the neck of the animal uh -huh. and it sucks all the blood, blood out. And in the same way it's going through the container, you add the anticoagulant in the right proportion. So it never coagulates again. That's great. Good so to the know. blood is collected every two days. So they are in a steered refrigerated tank until it's collected. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks. Disgusting. Yes, Sinead. Um, we use the, the valves from pig heart for yes. valves for ours. Yeah. Can we use the blood or is it very different from our oh, blood? No, it will be very different. Uh, we did a project with these same plastics uh, and we proved that they can be used as a scaffold for cell growth. And it performs as equally well as the regular scaffolds they use. So what I suggested, and Chaga said, we are food science, not biomedicine. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, I suggested to use self-transplants. So you get your own blood from a patient, you do your plastic, and use this for a transplant for skin or whatever. So no rejection. You are using your own body to heal yourself. But yeah, we are not biomedical scientists. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God for that. that Otherwise, we'd have a hospital full of blood. Uh, Carlos, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. All uh, right, that was very interesting. Um, all right, our next speaker is Elena Alexa, and Elena's talk is called Ensuring Food Safety in the Face of Climate Change. Uh, Dr. Elena Alexandra Alexa is a postdoctoral researcher in the food safety department here in Ashtown. She's going to discuss the effects of climate change on food safety. Very interesting. Elena. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Sorry. I have a question for the audience. How many of you have heard that climate change can also impact food safety? Raise a hand who ever heard of know about this. Okay, tough audience. <laughs> yeah. But I will make sure that this talk would be useful and I will give you some nice, interesting facts. Because majority of people associate climate change with increasing temperatures. Ah, yes, thank you. Sorry. And uh, each year becoming uh, hotter with less rainfall taking place or with the fact they are associating with uh, pollution or melting of ice glaciers. But this uh, alteration that happens can also have a huge impact, a huge implication for the biological contaminants in the environment, such as bacteria, viruses, and so on, that can reach onto the fruit, uh, on the food products that we consume. I mentioned earlier rainfall. Did you know that the average rainfall every year in Ireland is like filling a bathtub seven and a half times per square meter? And this is like three times more than what is happening in my country, in Romania. Does it seem a lot? What do you think? Yes. Well, maybe now, yes, but Ireland in the future will face hotter summers with less precipitation, with less rainfall taking place at certain times of the year. That will definitely impact uh, irrigation of crops. So how can we address this? Firstly, we have to take better care of what we already have now, 
of the available water resources from lakes and, uh, and rivers and so on. But we also have to know how to address water scarcity in the future. And one way to do this is by harvesting rainwater that we can use it to irrigate crops or we can use it in other areas of, uh, of uh, food production. And you might ask what this has to do with, uh, with food safety. Well, it has a lot of common because any water that we use in the food production systems uh, has to be of appropriate quality because there are regulations stipulating this at, uh, of, different, uh, of various parameters. And any treatment that we use in, uh, for, uh, for rainwater must be efficient to kill any harmful bacteria that you can see here or viruses and so, or other biological contaminants. Because if you don't do this, we, it can become a source of contamination for the, for the food, food products that we put on the table. My role here in Chagask, I'm involved in Hortashore project that is looking at chemical and microbiological safety of uh, fruits and vegetables. And one focus of this project is looking at finding solution of reusing uh, water that, uh, that uh, uh, we can use it like in, more, in a more sustainable or and also safe approach. And because this information will help us understand when and where water treatment may be necessary. Remember, we cannot see bacteria and viruses with, uh, with naked eye. I have here some fruits and vegetables. We mostly consume them uh, cook, uh, uncooked. Therefore, safe water, either for irrigation of crops or in the final washing, and rinsing before it gets placed uh, uh, in the bags, uh, packed and shipped to the market, is essential. And Ireland has a great reputation for food safety, and our food producers are working hard every day to make sure it stays this way. And what is the way forward? And uh, remember, any change in food production will definitely impact the profile of uh, microorganisms. And in the product, but also its environment. And this will, will change the risk profile. Here in Chagask, we are working at finding solutions or developing solutions that will ensure the safety of the, of the food products that we, we eat. More sustainable food production practices must, must be uh, necessary, uh, are needed, such as using organic waste streams or reduced energy use by uh, uh, for the crop production or new treatment options. But we also we are looking at making sure that no food safety hazards are arising, not only from what I spoke earlier about climate change issues, but also from introducing novel foods in our diet of what Eduardo mentioned earlier. Please stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Elena. Do we need to wash our food as much as we do? Um, yes, I mean, yes, <laughs> <laughs> we definitely have to wash our fruits and vegetables. Yes. What, what, why exactly? What, why, why do we need to, do we, we, do we need to wash them both when we pick them and when we serve them? Um, I think it depends on the uh, type of, because I mentioned earlier, we, we consume them uncooked. So it's better like to have washed fruits and vegetables in order to, uh, avoid any possible risk that may arise of if something is there, we'll make sure that we'll avoid this of happening of getting sick from. But it, it's, yeah. yeah. But it's not necessarily because, as I said, the food producers are making sure that it's, it's safe and they are using safe water in the food production systems. Mm. Therefore, it's, I think it's like a common sense, like, we have to wash, we have embedded in our heads, like we have to wash our fruits and vegetables. Um, could we use any other way of cleaning our food or is every other way just much more environmentally unfriendly? Well, um, mostly I think... Uh, say again? <laughs> <laughs> if we wash them with water, right, that's one way. Yes. Of, are there yeah, any yeah. other ways of cleaning off? Presumably the reason we wash them is to get rid of contaminants. Um, yeah. Uh, and, yes, yes, uh, yes. Is there any other way of doing that so that the we don't use water? We, we, we need to use water for uh, cleaning. Okay, so yeah. we have to use water. Yes. Okay. Um, and if, that I'm aware. <laughs> and are there ways that we can re significantly reduce the amount of water that we use to make the, the food safe? 
Well, uh, I depends on the on the crops. If we there are some crops that require more water or less water, so it depends on the. Right. Yeah. Uh, one question up here. Hi, Elena. Uh, are there any companies who are working with uh, the rainwater for irrigation of crops? Yeah, uh, I, I, I think so. Yes, yes, and uh, they are using uh, mostly for it. Can I mean they are using mostly for irrigation? Yes. Yeah. What about um, vertical farms? Uh, yes. Elena, are, are, yes. are vertical farms a much more efficient way of getting clean food because we don't need to worry about contaminants because they're self-contained vertical farms are sort of like... Mostly it's like uh, it's associated with reduced energy. So by having like all the, um, I don't know, the um, specific crops like on, on the vertical, we'll use like less energy and... It's a but but you also have a closed environment when you're growing them, so you can kind of grow them anywhere. Presumably, in that environment, you won't need to wash them uh, as much. Uh, yes, m maybe because we, they have like on the roots, they have like the pumping system that it goes only to the roots, okay. giving water. Can you tell me a little bit more about your research? Yes, so I'm uh, I'm in the food safety department. I'm working on on the project on Hortoshore, and I'm looking at the microbiological safety of uh, fruits and vegetables. Are there particular um, microbes that we should be worried about here in Ireland? Mostly people are aware that uh, Listeria uh, monocytogenes is, uh, is of concern because it has a high mortality rate and affects a lot of uh, I mean, uh, immunocompromised elderly or uh, pregnant uh, women. Although it's like an environmental uh, microorganisms, uh, in microorganisms, it can be harmful for, more harmful for these uh, specific uh, categories. Okay. Any other questions for Elena? Yes, uh, one here and one there. Yeah. Elena, how safe is rainwater? Is it contaminated? Drinking? Depends. I mean, depends on the uh, because uh, rainwater. Uh, there are um, if you use rainwater, it has like specific regulation with different parameters, like um, a different uh, concentration that is uh, like uh, allowed to have of, uh, mic of uh, microorganisms, but uh, depends also on the collection on and, uh, and storage of rainwater that can have a serious uh, impact on the, on the quality at afterwards. Yeah, so the storage needs to be clean if you're getting it from yeah. there. Uh, Seamus? Um, um, ultraviolet light, maybe for Listeria? Yes, and there are novel uh, technologies that can be used is to... That, is that more expensive uh, than, I suppose, water? Hard to get cheaper than water? I'm not aware that if it's m most more expensive, but there are novel technologies such as uh, uh, UV light or ultrasound that can be used to to inactivate uh, whatever is present in the in the water. Okay, ultrasound, very cool. All right, Elena, everybody, thanks, Elena. Thank you. Uh, our final speaker this evening, God, it's flown by, hasn't it? Is uh, Sinead McCarthy. Um, her talk is Sense and Sustainability, Healthy Eating for Body and Planet. Dr. Sinead McCarthy is a nutritionist and a researcher in the Agri-Food Business and Spatial Analysis Department here in Ashtown. She looks at the impact of the foods we produce and eat on the health of humans and the planet and suggests ways we can be more sustainable with our food choices. Sinead. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, well, I'm the last person standing between you and getting home to your beds, so I'll try and keep you awake and invigorate you a little bit um, and try and bring a little bit of sense to the topic of sustainability and hopefully maybe get a, some good questions and discussions from you. So back in 1993, um, meatloaf was topping the charts with I would do anything for love, but I won't do that. At the same time, the Department of Health were really busy launching their food pyramid as a guide to healthy eating. And this came out before I even considered pursuing a career in nutrition and health. So the food pyramid tells us about what we should eat. And if you look at the pyramid, it's a very solid structure with a big base. There's a really good foundation there. And that's what it's meant to be in terms of diet and health. And this food pyramid was developed as, as a picture, if you like, on how to educate us to eat well. Um, and in 1993, the environmental concerns of the day was acid rain, air pollution, smog, removing the, the, the smoky coals from the environment and so on. Carbon footprint and food and its climatic impact wasn't a consideration yet. 
but it is today. And we very much hear a lot in the media and in the news about how the, the climate footprint of or the, the carbon footprint of certain foods is much higher than other foods. We should eat this food and we shouldn't eat that food. That one has flown too far. That one was grown at home. So we get a lot of discussion on where our food comes from and how well we should eat it. So if we go back to the food pyramid, this tells us how we should eat our foods. And we've completed food consumption surveys in Ireland looking at how the population eats their food. And I look at this, these food consumption surveys to see, are we meeting our healthy eating guidelines? But also, how sustainable is the, is the pattern that we're consuming at the moment? And also, what's the carbon footprint of these foods? So let me take you on a little tour of the pyramids. We'll start off with fruit and veg. Five to seven portions of fruit and veg a day we should be eating. When we look at the national um, fruit and veg consumption level, we're seeing too little. So this kind of represents the amount of the shelf that we're eating. About two and a half portions a day or 180 grams the Irish population are consuming when it comes to fruit and veg. So there's a lot of room there for improvement because it's such it's, it's the foundation of our healthy eating. When we look at the cereal shelf and then the dairy shelf, we're actually quite good. So you can take a bow in that regard. We're eating about the right amount there or thereabouts, a little bit over or a little bit under, perhaps in some situations. Then we get to the meat where we can have our insects. We have beans, we have legumes and um, we have red meat with chicken, poultry, eggs and so on. We're eating a wee bit too much from this shelf and there's room for some improvement there. When it comes to the fats, we're actually all right. We're not putting too much on our food. We're not spreading too much butter on our bread. Um, but we need to stay within those boundaries. Now, when it comes to the top shelf, once or twice a week, we should be eating our treats. That can't be right. It is. Trust me, I'm a scientist, Jonathan. I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> We're eating far too much from this shelf. We're actually eating 600 grams a day from the top shelf of the food pyramids. We're eating three times the amount of fruit and veg. Now, if you were to take a treats, begin with a tea, only eat treats on the day of the week that has a tea. Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday. Tuesday and tomorrow. So go home. <laughs> <laughs> Today and tomorrow. Very good. I'm going to have to use a different analogy in future talks. So, <laughs> what's the carbon footprint like of our diet? So when we talk about the carbon footprint of food, it's essentially the collect collection of emissions, greenhouse gas emissions that are generated through the production and the consumption of our food. Generally, plant-based foods have a low carbon footprint, while the animal-derived proteins like red meat in particular have the highest carbon footprint. When we look at our fruit and veg over here in the corner, we're consuming or we're generating with those kind of miserable two and a half portions that we're eating a day, we're only generating about 200 grams of carbon from that shelf. When we look at the protein shelf, the biggest proportion is coming from red meat and that shelf is generating about 2.8 kilos of carbon each day. Now, the foods in the top shelf generally have a relatively low carbon footprint. There isn't a high carbon footprint associated with carbonated beverages or chocolate or, or sweets and confectionery. But we're still managing to generate 1.2 kilos of carbon from this shelf because we're eating so much of it. So what can we do about this? What recommendations can we make? Well, when we look at how we are eating, it's not very stable. We don't have that nice wide foundation at the bottom to support us into having healthy bodies and having a healthy planet as well. So we just see everything is about to just topple over if we don't start being more sustainable. So what's the good news? Because a lot of sustainability discussions can be very negative, but there's actually positive, positivity here, hopefully. We need to start with our fruit and veg. We need to increase our fruit and veg. There is nothing bad you can say about fruit and vegetables. They're very healthy. They're very rich in nutrients. It prevents weight gain. Um, it also fills us up. It can prevent heart disease, prevent certain cancers. So there's, there's no reason why we shouldn't eat more fruit and veg. We need to promote it more positively. When we see fruit and veg on the food pyramid, you're told to eat it because it's healthy. It's convenient, it's tasty, it's cheap. We need to promote all of these other characteristics associated with fruit and vegetables. Half of your plate, when you're making your dinner tomorrow evening or if you haven't had it already today, make sure half of your plate are vegetables. That's one way of getting it in. Put the bit of lettuce, tomato, sweet corn 
into your sandwich. Have a stir fry for dinner. Have the apple, have the grapes, have the strawberries there as your sweet treat when there isn't a tea in the week or in the day. <laughs> Juice, although we only have once a day, that's a serving of, of fruit and veg. And the other benefit, not just for our bodies, is for the planet, it has a low carbon footprint. So we can happily eat as much um, fruit and veg as we like. When it comes to red meat, we need to know our portions. How many hands have we got? Two hands, jazz hands. Um, your, the palm of your hand is approximately a serving of meat. So that's about 75 grams, and we should have two servings of 75 grams um, a day. So that's the maximum amount you should eat. So, <laughs> well, that, how thick is your hand? <laughs> that depends on how thick your hands are. If you have very big hands, you probably have a bigger requirement as well. So that's your guide. You have those portion sizes with you the whole time, so use them as, as your guide. Now, when it comes to the treats, even if we go with the tea in the day, today and tomorrow, or Tuesday and Thursday, we're still going to actually go beyond um, our recommendation. So, Saturday and Sunday, yeah, and keep it to the weekends when, when, whenever you like to, to treat yourself, but not more than twice a week. Now, if we were to follow these guidelines and stay within what the food pyramid is telling us to say, we would actually shave two kilos of carbon off our diet every single day. If we do that for 365 days um, a year, it's approximately three quarters of a ton of carbon. So... That's the same as a transatlantic flight. I think it's about one tonne of carbon is a transatlantic flight. So it's not only just healthy for our bodies to eat sustainably, it's also healthy for the planet. And that brings me to the end of my talk. Thanks, Sinead. I'm going to take your advice very literally. Um, you need five or six of those to be a portion. And it's washed. Did you check? I saw that. <laughs> we clean. I also here. swallowed the green bit. <laughs> um, questions, please, for Sinead. Uh, does that mean that if we adopted these food measures, we could celebrate by, with a trip to New York at the end of the year? Possibly. But um, I kind of negating all the good work in a way. Would you're it? negating all the good work, yeah. yeah. But I think we very much we, we've seen from all the presentations preceding mine, there isn't an aspect in our lives that we can't incorporate some element of sustainability, and and we all need to adopt more sustainable approaches within our lives. So it's a bit like if I eat 300 calories today, I can eat a thousand tomorrow, and I won't gain weight. And um, but it's more so um, to just make keep those savings, or it's like if I save my money this year, I can spend it next year. But if you spend it next year, it's gone. Yeah. So <laughs> to keep keep saving rather Absolutely. than spending. Over here. Yeah. Um, thank you, Sinead, for your interesting talk. Um, I have a question regarding the carbon footprint that you showed. So does this only include the consumption and, sorry, the production or also the transport? Because when I, for example, go to the supermarket here in Ireland, I have strawberries from Kenya, I have um, vegetables from Spain, but uh, meat products I'm getting here from Ireland. Yeah. So how is it calculated and what is your advice on that? Um, th that's a really big question <laughs> um, and, and there isn't a very short answer for it. I essentially, um, we should eat locally sourced and locally produced foods. I go to my local Lidl and the, the long stem broccoli comes from Kenya as well. And that's Lidl is four kilometres away from me and there's Bally McKenney Farm is eight kilometres away from me and they produce beautiful long stem broccoli that hasn't come um, from, from the, nearly the, the, the equator. Um, we should eat as local as possible and we should eat in season as well. So we shouldn't really have the, the strawberries here at this time of the year. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there is, that's one aspect of, of being sustainable. Um, and, and the carbon footprint that, that I use there is there, there's what's known as, when we calculate carbon footprint, there's known, um, what's known as the LCA. Um, analysis and that has different boundaries in terms of how you calculate the value but essentially the biggest proportion of the carbon footprint comes from where it's produced on the farm so about 80 to 90 percent of of the carbon footprint is from the farm and the rest of it is the transport the right. processing and so so on so whether it's transported from the other side of the globe or from the south of the country it doesn't enormously impact the um the, the carbon footprint but in saying that local is is 
is always best. So look for local Irish bananas, local Irish yeah. pineapples, yeah. <laughs> local Irish coconuts. Uh, Diane? Um, Janine, so then if you have your own, we'll say, tunnel or greenhouse at home, like growing your own at home, maybe that should be an initiative that we should have here in Ireland as well? Yeah, yeah, it, it certainly has. We, we all have that little bit of balcony space you can grow potatoes very easily on. Um, and even when we're at home, being being more sustainable, um, and even creating our own compost with with the the organic waste in the kitchen, and and use that for growing your own at home. So it's just lots of small little measures. If we just shave off from every part of our lives, we c- we can live more sustainably, and not just the, the food just, consumption. Just on yes, that. Yeah. My my mum used to say, if I wanted chips when I was a kid, she said the spuds are out there. Go out and dig them up, bring them in, peel them, off you go. There you go. Um, just a question about, I suppose, with the increased cost of living. Like, obviously, vegetables themselves are quite cheap. Although, fruit seems to be going up. Like, obviously, meat is going up, so people are eating less of that. But it's the on the top shelf of the pyramid. That's the usually the cheapest food, the most processed, mass-produced food. So, for especially families and younger people and <coughs> PhD students um, <laughs> who wouldn't have that much money. Very specific like, example. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, like, what do you think would be a lot of the solutions there? Just because obviously a lot of this good organic stuff um, that is being produced is a lot more expensive as well. Before you answer that, I want to do a quick um, guess, a bidding war for how much it costs for a head of broccoli in my local Avoca. So let's. Who's the who? Can you give me who, who's the starting figure? One fifty. Go higher. Two. Two. Go higher. Four. Go higher. Go higher. Five. Six. No. Four. Four euro twenty five for one piece of broccoli. Sorry, I have to bring that in. And um, the, the the first solution is increase the stipend for the PhD students. Yeah, I think yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that that that's one way the of addressing it. answer <laughs> I would imagine you need in this room. I that will. I will be running for person. office next yeah, year. Exactly. <laughs> Um, the the second it actually isn't as expensive as as you think. A bag of crisps to come back to your um, head of broccoli and avoca. A bag of crisps in my local centre is one twenty. The apple is actually cheaper than that. So it's it's actually I think it, it's a bit like um, a certain black stouty beverage is good for you <laughs> campaign. This myth that that the the highly processed foods on the top shelf, the bars of chocolate. It, it's not it, it's not even necessarily the highly processed foods like your coca noodles that I'm talking about. It's more so it's the chocolate, it's the beverages, it's the alcohol. Um, alcohol is, is, is one of the foods that doesn't get mentioned in the sustainability debates. We tend to see the, the, the meat, it's kind of meat or no meat tends to be the discussion that comes out in the sustainability debate. But we forget about the carbon impact of everything else that we eat as well. And when we're eating completely out of balance on that top shelf, it needs to be discussed. And Coming back to your situation, when we looked at different, um, within the research that we've been doing, my colleagues Marie and Clarissa are up at the back there. You might have visited them at the fruit and veg shelf and sustainable diet out in the main hall. When we look at, at the research and the patterns of consumption, it's young men eating a lot of processed foods and eating, or rather drinking far too much alcohol that are generating the highest carbon footprint in, in the dietary pattern. That's awful altogether. That's all. So. I don't know anyone who's like that at all. <laughs> I don't know anybody who's like that. Not PhD students though, so it's all, no other words. That <laughs> is, uh, one more. We have one more very quick. Very quick. No, just on that, um, I know, I don't know if anyone heard, but the at COP27, they started an initiative called Beans is How, and they're basically trying to like double bean consumption in around the world because they're so cheap and like so full of protein. So just as another alternative. Oh, the PhD I, students nodding, yes, beans are cheap. Yeah. Yes, we, we, we. <laughs> yeah, no, as somebody who only recently moved out of home, I'm very, very <laughs> glad to go towards the yeah. bean But yeah, they're a really great solution. I think, again, like there's something that's kind of overlooked at the moment, but it looks like it'll be good in the future. There could be a few additional gaseous emissions we might have to deal with from, yeah. from the, the bean scenario. But it is, the, the beans are a very good source on that protein shelf as well. So when we look at the, the, the protein shelf, it's not huge consumption of beans and legumes that we're seeing but it's that just a, and it's a small overconsumption of meat but that's because the carbon footprint is high of, of meat products that small overconsumption generates a, a big carbon footprint so if collectively we bring our diets back in line with the shape of how we should eat that in itself just shaving a little bit off everything but increasing the bottom and um, will, will really make a big difference Sinead McCarthy everyone
I can go. <laughs> uh, so that's all we have time for this evening. Uh, thanks to our speakers, Owen Corbett, Diane Purcell Mehring, uh, Eduardo Neves, Carlos Alvarez, Elena Alexa, and Sinead McCarthy. Thanks too to the researchers on the stands at the exhibition and to Carol Griffin and Moira Caffrey for organizing the event. Thanks to Aoife for interpreting all of my bad jokes. Um, and also thanks to Science Foundation Ireland and Chagask. Thanks as well to the Science Week Committee who've been putting together full program events uh, of events this week at the Festival for Farming and Food. Um, thank you all for uh, this evening. I hope you enjoyed everything and, and learning about some of the amazing research that's done here at, uh, at Chagas in Ashtown. And apologies for all my fluffing. I don't know. I think I got up a little bit late, late uh, early this morning. So I can even say get up early this morning. Thanks very much for joining us. I've been Jonathan McRae partly. Um, have a great evening and enjoy the rest of Science Week. <laughs> <laughs>